Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. So Democratic Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, or Red Cortez as I like to call her, has caused a stir since being elected to Congress during the midterms in 2018. An avowed democratic socialist, which she tries to insist is somehow different to normal socialism, even though it is really just the same pig, different lipstick, she has been spouting some of the most radically left-wing rhetoric that US Congress has heard for some time possibly even more so than Bernie Sanders. The extent of her radical progressivism was revealed when her famous Green New Deal was rolled out early last year, which was, if you took it bit by bit, a plan for a grand rollout of a socialist regime in the USA disguised as an environmental welfare plan. Don't believe me? Well, Red's former chief of staff admitted just that in an interview with the Washington Post, saying to the publication, Do you guys think of it as a climate thing? Because we really think of it as a how do you change the entire economy thing. Hmm. She's also notable for refusing to condemn Antifa when asked. Will you condemn Antifa for the attack in Washington? It's easy to condemn a terrorist attack. Will you be condemning Antifa? They firebombed an American facility. Will you condemn them? Excuse us, we have to get to the minute. Will you be condemning them? Do you feel like you have some responsibility in the attack with your rhetoric about concentration camps? Are you responsible? Do you feel ashamed? and for fundraising for their bail money. One way to support the local LGBTQ community impacted by Boston's white supremacist parade, contribute to the bail fund for the activists who put themselves on the line protecting the Boston community. For the record, it uh, wasn't a white supremacist march or anything of the sort. It was a so-called straight pride parade held as a joke to troll the radical left. But, you know, since the regressive left thinks anyone to the right of Bernie is a white supremacist, it's not surprising that Red Cortez would pander to her rabid base by spreading this kind of lie. You liar! Then, of course, there was the video she made recently with her boyfriend on how white people can apparently avoid being racist. So, Riley, what has been helpful to you in combating racism? Uh, I think it's helpful and important to talk to other white people about racism. And I think a lot of people, they don't want to be racist. They don't think that they're racist, but they also don't know some of the things that they believe or say are and can be racist. And I think one of the like effective ways is just to talk and kind of help teach them about why some of the things they believe or say or think are wrong. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily racist, but that they're wrong. And that'll sort of like chip away and, you know, contribute to some development in this area, but not necessarily take somebody from like being a racist mm -hmm. to not being a racist in one conversation. And it's just always being open to learning about racist things that we may have said or done without judgment and defensiveness. <laughs> Speak for yourself, my guy. Anyway, it's not just her extremist policy decisions or her defense of political violence when it comes from her own side or her radically leftist rhetoric or the fact she has decided to use the word radical to describe herself as if that's some kind of a good thing that Little Red is known for. She's also made a number of very public gaffes, for lack of a better word, which have made her the butt of a number of Republican jokes. And while yes, these are admittedly low-hanging fruit, she and her regressive leftist pals are absolutely not above seizing on the equally low-hanging fruit of their political opponents when it suits them. So, in honor of keeping the playing field entirely level, here are four of my favorite Red Cortez slip-ups, all of which are a fascinating insight into what is behind the public veneer. But before I tell you what they are, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. I'm sure that you've watched maybe one or two or three or maybe even more of my videos by now, but you haven't yet hit that subscribe button. Well, if you like my content and you want to be notified whenever I release a video or do a live stream, then now is the perfect chance to subscribe. I would really, really love to hit
hit 200,000 subscribers by my birthday in July. That would be very cool. So if you like my videos, then hit that subscribe button right now. I would love to have you. Number one, the fake economist. As a democratic socialist, Red Cortez obviously has an interest in economics and in fact has an economics degree, which is why it surprised an awful lot of people when recently she appeared on Instagram citing the work of someone called Milton Keynes that she said was an economist. It's funny you ask this because I was just reading today about how Milton Keynes, a famous uh, economist back in the day, predicted that by 2030, US GDP would grow six to eight times what it is, which would allow for everyday people to work 15 hours a week. Now, Red sounds pretty sure of herself here, which makes it all the more interesting when you realize that Milton Keynes doesn't actually exist. There is no famous economist called Milton Keynes. As it turns out, Red Cortez had mixed up Milton Friedman, known for his enthusiasm for the free market, with John Maynard Keynes, a 20th century British economist whose work she was actually referring to. Fortunately for her, she realized her mix-up and posted soon afterwards, Ugh, typo, it's John Maynard Keynes, mixed his name with Milton Friedman, a very different economist. Now we all make typos, I know I do, but the fact remains that Red Cortez not only typed Milton Keynes, but said it as well. Milton Keynes, a famous uh, economist. Also, in a rather glorious coincidence, Milton Keynes is actually the name of a small town in England, which is famous for being the most ridiculed town in the UK because of its terrible design and excess of roundabouts. 1300 to be precise, more than any other town in the UK. I mean, you couldn't write it, really. Number two, misunderstanding metaphor. Last week, when discussing the level of poverty in the USA, she had this to say about the well-known saying, to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Ms. Hutchinson, I also want to thank you about bringing up the poverty draft and this idea of a bootstrap. You know, this idea and this metaphor of a bootstrap started off as a joke because it's a physical impossibility to lift yourself up by a bootstrap by your shoelaces, it's physically impossible. The whole thing is a joke. Okay, so at first glance, it sounds like she is taking the saying literally and totally missing the metaphor. I mean, we all know that it is physically impossible to literally pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Certainly, her spiel raised a few eyebrows in conservative circles who picked up on the fact that she seemed to have confused a metaphor with reality. However, what she was actually saying, none too clearly, was that the saying, to pull yourself up by your bootstrap, started out as an ironic expression, referring to doing something completely absurd. Since pulling yourself up by your bootstraps is, as we know, physically impossible, the original meaning was, of course, to do something impossible. Red Cortez simply articulated this badly, very badly, hence the ridicule. Obviously, the saying has evolved since then to mean succeeding without any external help. The point Red was trying to make was that it is impossible to succeed with no external help whatsoever, and therefore the fact conservatives apparently use that metaphor to describe striving for the American dream is, well, apparently a joke. However, what she's failed to realize is that no conservative would assert that a self-made person succeeds with zero help from other people. Even the most self-made of millionaires coming from the very bottom has to be given a break somewhere along the line. The point of the metaphor from a conservative standpoint is an argument against big government and obscenely high taxes. It refers to the potential of human beings to create a life for themselves without the help of excessive government handouts. So the point Red is making is pretty evident, but she's just not making it very well. Poor Red. Number three, disregard for facts. Now, we are all very aware that the progressive or regressive left is a little bit soft on the facts, to say the least. To the casual observer, they seem far more concerned with what they consider to be moral and holding that over people as the only kind of moral absolute to live by, and therefore, everyone who disagrees with them is apparently a bigot. And while they insist that it's they, not everybody else, who has the facts of the matter correct, what they really mean is that their opinions are supposedly correct because facts are secondary to morality or at least what they consider to be moral. Now, when you put this to a regressive leftist, they will deny it and call you some sort of name like racist, sexist, bigot, you know, the usual. Which is why it came as such a lovely surprise when Red Cortez accidentally admitted that yes, facts are indeed secondary to what she and her pals consider to be moral. 
Take a look at this infamous interview she did with Anderson Cooper of CNN. I think that there's a lot of people more concerned about being precisely, factually, and semantically correct than about being morally right. Well, that pretty much sums her up, doesn't it? Number four, soft on the details. Red Cortez is a longtime advocate for Palestine and has spoken out about it time and time again. Now, you'd think that someone who is so seemingly sure of their point of view and so quick to denounce anyone who disagrees with them as not only wrong but, you know, evil, would have an extremely thorough knowledge of the subject matter. I mean, by publicly advocating so vehemently for anything with such a confident manner, it would stand to reason that any question someone threw at you about the topic you'd be able to answer on your head. Well, not in the case of Red Cortez. Soon after being elected, she had this to say when asked her opinion on the Israel-Palestine situation. But uh, I am, of course, the, the dynamic there in terms of geopolitics of and the course. war in the Middle East is very different than mm. people expressing their First Amendment right to protest. Well, yes, but I also think that what people are starting to see, at least in, in the occupation uh, of, of Palestine, is um, just an, an increasing crisis of humanitarian condition. And that to me is just where I tend to mm -hmm. come from on this issue. You use the term the occupation of Palestine. Mm. What did oh. you mean by that? Oh, um, I think it, what I meant is like the, the settlements that are increasing in, in some of these areas and, and places where, um, where Palestinians are experiencing uh, difficulty in access to uh, their housing and homes. Do you think you can expand on that? Yeah, I mean, I think I'd also just, I, I am not the expert on geopolitics on this issue. I am certain that since then, Red has strengthened her knowledge of the topic. The point is, however, that if you make strong general statements in public, you should probably have a few things to back them up with. After all, the devil is always in the detail. Well, there you have it, my four favorite Red Cortez faux pas. While she is certainly an impressive orator and extremely sure of herself, there are certainly times when the curtain slips and her lack of substance comes shining through. If you liked that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment, and if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for my subscribe star link and other ways you can support me.